Back in June of 2019, if someone would have sat me down and told me that the $3,300 iMac I was buying would be almost equally matched and replaced by a baseline 13-inch MacBook Pro within a year and a half, I would have been a bit skeptical. But of course, since November of last year, I think it's fair to say that we've all been blown away by Apple Silicon, specifically the M1 chips and what they've been able to provide users performance-wise. It has not been a perfect ride, however. In a previous video, I talked about why buying the 8GB variant of MacBook Pro was a mistake, at least for me with the sort of kind of clickbait title I might add, but now I finally have the right model for my needs. And considering that I've used this laptop every day for the past four months, specifically for my creative work here on YouTube, I think it's finally time for me to share my long-term review. Despite the fact that this laptop hasn't had a design overhaul in oh, almost five years now, I am still very pleased with the fit and finish. Even more now with the Magic Keyboard they've implemented starting with the 16-inch MacBook Pro in 2019. All the time, I can't help but appreciate how solid and high quality this laptop feels in the hand. People often dog on Apple for the high price of their laptops, but I'm here to say this thing feels like a thousand bucks and some change. More on input though. The keyboard is just fantastic, and it's my favorite on any laptop that I've used thus far. I often work from my parents' house, which accommodates an open laptop and external display kind of setup. This forces me to use this keyboard all the time for everything from writing my videos, conducting product research, typing up video descriptions and keywords, and trust me, I don't mind it at all. If anything, I'm perfectly content with the keyboard material, spacing, tactility, and responsiveness. There's always room for improvement though. And to no one's surprise, the glass trackpad on this laptop is best in class as well. This is a pretty typical characteristic of MacBooks, I'd say, at least over the past decade or so. Uh, I'm constantly using it while working in Photoshop on my video thumbnails and Final Cut Pro while navigating project timelines, scrubbing, splicing, and reorganizing clips. Simply put, it's just big enough, extremely tactile, solid, and premium. As for the touch bar, uh, yeah, it's uh, something I could definitely live without or do without. I never really find myself using it actually, whether I'm creating content or consuming content with this laptop. I find that traditional input and good old keyboard shortcuts are more than enough for me in my workflow. I also consistently use the M1 MacBook Air for school, which completely lacks this feature, and I really don't miss it. The touch bar was a nice idea and it's definitely looked cool, I'll give Apple that, but I think we can all agree it needs to go, sort of like how 3D Touch died with the iPhone XS series. While it did seem innovative back in 2016, nearly five years later it has proven to be nothing more than a well-designed novelty feature. I.O. is also something else I'm not super happy about. And I know this is a baseline MacBook and the baseline Intel variant before it only had two ports as well, but I really need another port. It's a bit of a struggle sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. The two port life is not an easy one. It's definitely not the end of the world though and dongles do help. I for one need to copy data from SD cards all the time, specifically images and video clips for my content. And as we know, an SD card reader has been absent from the MacBook Pro line since the 2016 refresh, so additional ports don't really help me here. But at the same time, I really hope that future newer iterations offer more than just two USB Type-C 4.0 ports, especially for what you're paying. And I say this because with the implementation of Apple Silicon, MacBook Pro 13 inch is no longer just a glorified student or business laptop. It's a creative machine and a very capable one at that. And on the topic of Apple Silicon, beyond performance, battery life with this laptop, at least compared to its predecessor and some of its competitors, is simply legendary. Now I haven't actually sat down and conducted any real scientific tests to substantiate this claim, but what I can say with confidence is that I no longer worry about this laptop dying when I'm not plugged in or on the go. Gone are the days when simple tasks like word processing, video chatting, and content consumption low-key stress me out when I'm not attached to the wall. And as things begin to open up and I'm no longer predominantly working from my home or apartment, I'm going to appreciate the insane amount of screen on time this laptop offers more and more. In short, for the first time since Apple's PowerPC to Intel transition in 2006, battery life and TDP have become marketable, important standout features that make upgrading totally worthwhile. Unlike the touch bar, M1's crazy energy efficiency brings massive added benefits that are, I would say, impossible to not notice or ignore.
On a different note, however, the topic of battery life brings to mind another area where I think the MacBook Pro can improve a lot, and that is display. And I'm aware, I know of all the rumors spreading about, I'm sure you've heard them once or twice as well, many LEDs come into the MacBook line, to which models we've yet to find out officially. And while color, contrast, and brightness are important display aspects, sharpness or resolution are categories I think many, including Apple, have neglected. Now, considering Macs have been purely x86 or Intel based up until last year, I can totally understand why Apple engineers were hesitant to beef up resolution while trying to meet acceptable screen on time figures or standards. I mean, after all, the more pixels there are to drive, the harder your CPU or rather GPU has to work, which in turn draws more power and drains your battery more quickly. So again, and in other words, I can totally understand why 2560 by 1600 has been the standard resolution for a 13.3 inch retina display since 2013. But now that the power consumption and performance constraints have been alleviated or lifted by a significant amount thanks to ARM processor architecture and Apple's in-house designs and optimizations, upping the resolution to let's say 3840 by 2400 isn't unreasonable in the slightest. At a 13.3 inch and 16 by 10 form factor, it would deliver a pixel density of 340 up from 227, an absolutely noticeable increase that would serve to push an even more refreshing and sharp macOS user experience. Creative professionals would also appreciate this as they could finally play back 4K video or display high resolution images at close to, if not native resolution without having to buy an external 4K plus display. Long story long, if Dell can implement a pretty much identically specced 13.4 inch 3840 by 2400 display into their XPS 13, which mind you is an Intel machine, uh, I think Apple is capable of doing this as well. All in good time, of course. Another display critique that I have goes beyond the built-in one. The fact that M1 Max can only officially drive a single display upsets me a little bit. I am fortunate because my setups only really involve a single 4K panel anyway, but I'm not everyone. There are plenty of people who require more than one external display to work efficiently and comfortably, and I think it's a shame this sort of expansion or functionality isn't supported out of the box. Granted, I'm willing to forgive Apple if this is just a matter of software and hardware optimization. Uh, perhaps the team behind the M1 chip had one major priority before the launch of M1 Max, that being performance, and maybe multi-display support wasn't working the way they wanted it to, and they plan on you know working on it right now in the present moment and rolling out a refined version later down the line. I mean, after all, Intel has had years to figure this out, and they wouldn't just share their trade secrets with a mere lifestyle company in the world of Intel's current CEO. At the end of the day though, I'm hoping that official multi-display support will be added later down the line for all Apple Silicon Macs. But if this feature is going to be designated for their higher end M1X or M2 machines that should exceed the $1,500 price range, again, I'm gonna be a bit disappointed. But an aspect of this laptop that does the opposite of disappoint me, however, is performance. And if you've been watching MacBook oriented content for the past four months, I'm sure this is a pretty obvious statement, but Hear me out. Make no mistake, these are not perfect machines. Despite all the marketing coming from Apple and all the hype coming from creators, including myself, these machines are not the end game. They are just the beginning of a very exciting industry shifting processor transition from Apple. But even with the correct or more realistic expectations, I'm willing to bet that M1 will still blow you away by what it brings to the table. It seems that for the first time in computing history, people are arguing that Macs offer great bang for your buck. The Apple tax or price premium no longer just provides enhanced build quality and an alternative operating system to Windows. You're now getting a chipset that brings unprecedented, incredible energy efficiency, as I touched on earlier, and insane performance, especially considering the baseline status this laptop falls into. Like I said at the beginning of the video, this laptop, at least the 16 gig variant, is about equally matched to my fully specced out Vega 48 Core i9 40 gig equipped 2019 iMac 5K at 4K video editing and rendering. I did, however, have some performance issues with the 8 gb variant, as an intensive task like this requires greater amounts of memory, regardless of whether it's in the DDR or unified integrated categories. But again, if you go the 16 gb route with the M1 MacBook Pro, performance is going to impress you daily. Sure, I run into some stutter here and there, and Rosetta isn't always perfect, but considering what I can throw at this machine for what it is and what I paid for it, 
it's just kind of mind-boggling. It seems almost too good to be true, like there's some kind of dark magic on the inside at work or something, but no, this is Apple flexing its muscles, subtly I might add. They've had more than a decade to develop and perfect their own proprietary hardware and software optimizations, and so far a small portion of this prowess and power has been made available in the form of the M1 Mac lineup. But while high performance is all well and good, you might be wondering how I manage with the baseline 256 gig storage variant. And the answer is just fine, actually. I'm using about half of my entire drive, including the base system and all of my Photoshop project files. I mean, listen, if you can afford it, I'd go with a 512 gig variant just to play it safe and for some extra creative breathing room. But when it comes to mass storage, the external route is always the way to go. And like every other tech YouTuber, I'm not exaggerating, I'm going to recommend that you buy Samsung T5 SSDs for your workflow. They're compact, fast, and 100% reliable in my experience. I use two at the moment, one to store my B-roll and another for my Final Cut Pro library. Working externally within macOS and with macOS applications is a seamless experience as well. You just have to make sure that you have the necessary drive or drives plugged in before you begin work. So that's been my experience with the M1 MacBook Pro. It's an incredibly well-built, long-lasting, and powerful device that impresses me each and every day that I put it to use. It does, however, bleed. It's no invincible beast as some frame it. It also has several aspects that need desperate overhaul, some more than others. But at the end of the day, the fact that I can comfortably drive my intensive content creation workflow on a device of this class and price blows my mind even four months later. And that about wraps things up here. I've been sitting in this chair for the past hour and I'm pretty sure my camera is about to overheat or die or both. But regardless, I hope you found this video helpful, fun, and hopefully high quality. I know I haven't been posting as much, but I am now you know, taking the time to create higher quality videos. And hopefully you enjoyed watching this just as much as I have enjoyed taking the time to create it. And with that said, as always, I'm Noah and I will catch you all in the next one.